Um, we've got a really brilliant panel of speakers today, people from the UK, the Netherlands, uh, from India, from Rwanda, um, and we're going to be covering a number of different topics with lots of short and snappy talks. So we've got five people talking um, initially doing five minute talks each, uh, and then a panel discussion that's going to follow that. So the first half an hour or so is going to be listening to short talks, and then the second half an hour is going to be um, much more informal discussion about those talks and the wider issues. If you've got any questions that you'd like to ask our panel, then please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to do that. So that's separate from the chat. You'll see it at the bottom of the screen. If you click on Q&A, that will pop up and it will allow you to ask a question. And you can see the questions that other people have asked and you can comment on them. You can vote them up if you like the look of them. We'll try and get through as many of those questions as possible. Um, I suspect we'll have more questions than we have time for, but we'll see how we get on. So first of all, we're going to find out what we mean by active ingredients. It's a, it's a bit of an unusual phrase. Um, so we're going to find out what they are and how the Wellcome Trust is using this way of thinking in their work. And then we're going to look at some specific projects that the Wellcome Trust have funded recently. Um, a series of short talks on four topics, uh, neighborhood cohesion, behavioral activation, self-evaluation, and harnessing emotional mental imagery. So um, that's it from me for now. Um, our first speaker is uh, Kat Sebastian. Uh, Kat is the evidence lead for the mental health priority area at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and Kat's going to spend a few minutes introducing us to this area of work. So uh, welcome Kat and over to you. Thanks Andre for the introduction and for organising this webinar and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, as Andre mentioned my name is Kat Sebastian and I'm the evidence lead for the Wellcome Trust mental health priority area. Um, together with Miranda Walpert who's head of the priority area I've been working on our science strategy and in particular our active ingredients approach. Before we hand over to our fantastic speakers, I wanted to give you a bit of background on our approach at Welcome and what this Active Ingredients Commission has been about. So the mental health priority area is focused on working towards a world in which no one is, is held back by mental health problems, with a specific focus on youth anxiety and depression. And we're particularly interested in understanding more about what works for whom and why in the prevention, intervention and management of these symptoms. We've mapped out a five year programme where the first two years are about laying foundations and understanding the current state of the research landscape in this area, after which we plan to fund primary research to fill in gaps in the existing evidence base. The term active ingredients is really an integral to this approach. Um, so what we mean by active ingredients are those factors or components that are really making the difference in reducing young people's experiences of anxiety and depression symptoms. Often when interventions are evaluated, several components are banded together. For example, CBT consists of many components plus important factors such as the therapeutic alliance, which are sort of quite hard to operationalize. So it's been hard to evaluate the relative contribution of each and the exact mechanisms underpinning success. Another issue is that there are many things that young people may do to improve their own mental health without the help of a clinician that receive very little research attention. So for example, the use of green spaces or exercise. And of course, there are societal and economic factors that impact mental health indirectly, but are nonetheless vital to understand. We're interested in all of these components. I think of them as ingredients. This is related to the idea that improvement in symptoms is usually a result of a combination of factors that will be individual to each person. So the metaphor we've been thinking about is sort of like baking a cake. So a young person should be empowered to use these ingredients in a store cupboard to tailor what works for them. But before we get there, we need to understand what exactly the evidence says about these ingredients. What are the best bets? For youth intervention in anxiety and depression. But for this first active ingredients commission that ran over the summer, we commissioned 30 research teams to review the existing evidence on 26 active ingredients that were chosen by the researchers. 
we had a broad range represented across the spectrum from biological to cognitive to relational to societal. Four teams will be presenting today, but if you'd like to see the findings from across the Commission, please do look at the Mental Health website and YouTube channel for blogs, videos and podcasts from our other teams. I would also stress that these 26 ingredients are by no means meant to be exhaustive and in 2021 we'll be repeating this commission with a focus on gaps identified in the 2020 commission. I think there are several ways in which this commission differed from the standard approach to academic reviews. The thread that runs throughout our entire programme is a focus on involving the voice of young people with lived experience at every stage of the research process. We therefore asked teams to make consultation with young people a cornerstone of their research plan. We'll hear more about that from our speakers, including Grace Gatera, one of Wellcome's lived experience consultants and an, an advisor to us throughout this commission. Another important difference is that we asked researchers to meet regularly with each other and with us to encourage communication across different research areas that are often siloed with little communication. As a result, we had some very fruitful discussions and debates that fed into reviews, as well as the beginnings of collaborations that may not have formed otherwise. Where possible, we also asked researchers to review the evidence globally and to highlight where evidence was lacking, particularly in low and middle income countries. Finally, we asked teams to consider context. So does the ingredient work for some but not others? And if so, why? Altogether, this was a different way of working for me, and I very much enjoyed working with and learning from the research teams. I'm really looking forward to hearing their research today, and this seems a good point to hand back to Andre to introduce our speakers for the session. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Kat. That's great. Um, if you've got any questions for Kat and questions generally about this program of work at Welcome, then do please um, put those into the Q&A and we'll tackle those uh, in 20 minutes or so when all the other presentations are finished. Um, and check out Twitter. If you follow Active Ingredients MH on Twitter, there's a number of tweets that we've sent already that link to more detail of this work that Kat's describing, um, the website, various blogs that have been written over the last few months. So do read more detail if you wish. Okay, so our next speaker is Josephine Breedfelt uh, from Amsterdam. Uh, Josephine is the Assistant Director of the Centre for Urban Mental Health at the University of Amsterdam uh, and she's presenting a review that she did as part of this welcome work on neighbourhood social connection. So thanks a lot for joining us Josephine, over to you. Thank you for having me here. I want to discuss four main points today. First, what lies behind the somewhat enigmatic term of neighbourhood social cohesion? Second, why we set out to study it as our best bet for preventing depression and anxiety. Third, how we studied it to answer our research question. And fourth, our findings. Neighborhood social cohesion is a multidimensional concept. There are many definitions and a more detailed and theoretical framework is provided in the report. For this review, we use the definition of Kowachi and Bergman, which consists of two key items. First, the presence of strong social bonds, for example, having trust, positive relationships. And second, the absence of latent social conflict, for example, the lack of racial and ethnic tensions, income inequality, and polarization. In other words, these are the factors that bring us together and pull us apart. What really spurred us on to study this was that we found longitudinal studies suggesting that it might protect or mitigate against the risk of developing mental health conditions, especially after young people experience adverse events or growing up in a low socioeconomic status neighborhood. We also wanted to find new target points for preventing beyond short-term interventions, which currently have limited long-term effects. We really wanted to study what the long-term fostering effect of community change might bring. So we set out to study whether it can be preventative. In order to answer a research question, we conducted a rapid review where 20% of searches, inclusions and extractions were cross-checked by a second author. We spoke to young people to find out what mattered to them. And we looked online for bright ideas and using an extensive online search for citizen science projects, policy reports, and anything that could tell us more about effectiveness and implementation of this ingredient. 
In terms of our findings, in terms of the peer review literature, we double screened over 2000 studies and included 11 longitudinal studies. Within these studies, we found a number of factors that we call building blocks um, that could be potential target points for intervention as an increase or relative decrease in them was associated with reduced symptoms of depression and also to a lesser extent anxiety at follow up. In the image, you can see the factors that we identified. These roughly also map onto the key elements that we defined with the definition of Kawachi and Berkman, namely positive relationships and decrease in social conflict. As the measurement for these factors was often combined, future research should tease out these to further assess the complex interplay of these factors over time. We also did not find any intervention studies, so we can't really say whether an increase or decrease will definitely lead to prevention and onset, but we found evidence to suggest that this was the case from the adult literature when we looked at neighborhood regeneration pro programs and social capital support interventions. We also spoke to young people and they said that neighborhood social cohesion can be a protective active ingredient, but only if done in the right way. Also, we should mind our wording as cohesion was felt as a little bit too wordy. So we have started to move towards using neighborhood social connection instead. We identified together with young people four opportunities. First, co-designing community centers with activities that foster connections between different communities, also intergenerational interaction. Second, co-designing the built environment to create safe spaces to just be, meet and interact and ensure it meets with what young people really want. We should ensure that we give them a chance and really a voice in the planning of new development and regeneration projects. Third, creating inclusive in community groups where everyone can get involved and making sure that these are really make, meeting the need as to what young people would like. It's also important here to improve the signposting as such groups are often not really known in the community and young people said to us that they weren't aware of any community groups in some cases. And especially now with COVID, it's very important to look at what online spaces can bring. We can think of working together with social media platforms or local authorities to create online community boards or what about some kind of community matching app uh, where we can recommend friends and activities in the area to meet online, but also facilitate uh, offline interactions. So to quickly sum up, I hope that I have showed you what current evidence we have for this core component and the potential next steps for this core component. And we're really keen to move forward with a clear theoretical framework that we developed as part of this project to seize the opportunities where we can uh, both online and offline with the best methods available to increase cohesion in our communities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Josephine. That's great. You've clearly been practicing. That was exactly five minutes. Well done. <laughs> That's what I like to see. Um, really interesting work. And I remi it reminds me, I, my grandparents um, are Dutch and they used to live um, just outside Amsterdam. And I was always really struck when I went to visit them in their um, in their home in the last 10 years of their lives because they lived with lots of students. They had loads of students living in this old people's home, you know, mm -hmm. and the students had lunch and breakfast with the old people and they got free accommodation if they did stuff in this. It's very Dutch and practical and sensible approach. Um, so yeah, I think this, it has lots, to, we have lots to learn about how, you know, our, our societies um, can act differently to the current arrangement in different places. Really fascinating. Okay, um, so if you have any questions for Josephine, please do put them in the Q&A and we will come to those in uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, but next is uh, Kanika. So Kanika Malik is um, a, a clinical psychologist and the project director of the school mental health program at Sangath in India. Um, and she's joining us here today to talk about a project on behavioral activation uh, that she led for Welcome that she's going to be presenting for us. So Kanika, the floor is yours. You're muted at the moment, Kanika. Oh yeah, I'm able to unmute myself, thank you. There we go, we can hear you now, thank you. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Kanika. I'm from Sangat and I will be talking about behavioral activation, which in simple terms is how you can increase your activities and engagement in positive activities to deal with depression and anxiety. Why we choose behavioral activation as an ingredient for study for this commission? Um, there has been a lot of research in adults which have shown, you know, BA works. It works very well with depression. It's one of the uh, well-established uh, technique for adult depression. There have been a lot more studies which show it does not only work for depression, but also anxiety, substance abuse, and other serious mental illnesses. Their trial, which has shown, you know, it's more cost-effective than the um, gold standard CBT. It has been used in multiple cultures, uh, low middle income countries. Uh, so with all this thing, you know, we were really inquisitive how it works with the young people, especially in young people where um, cognitive skills are slow to develop. Does something like BA, which focus on tangible behavior does work with them. So with that in mind, we took on this study. Uh, uh, you know, as a part of study, we're trying to look at whether BA works by looking at three different uh, sort of evidence. One, what is the evidence from the randomized control trials where BA either has been used as an intervention in itself or as part of other uh, intervention. What this qualitative study shows uh, says about BA, you know, how young people like it and how much of uh, BA is being used by young people in the natural environment. And then we talked to a lot of uh, young advisors from India, how they see the relevance of BA in their life and how they infer these findings. So on my screen, you can see the findings. I'm trying my best to summarize it. What we found that um, there were quite a few RCTs and qualitative study, but mostly from high income countries. There are barely any research from low income country. In most of the studies where BA has been used, uh, the target has been depression. So unlike um, adult studies where they have a lot more focus on anxiety and other condition, it was not found in these uh, in our target population. We found that uh, B was used as a standalone intervention in only few studies, it was just three RCTs we could find out, but it was used along with other multi-component intervention in many studies. Regardless of where it was used, B was always accompanied by other behavioral strategies. So you will see a lot of relaxation, problem solving, and other behavioral strategies always accompanying B. Cognitive was used in few of them and mostly as secondary to all these behavioral elements. What was exciting to see there's been a lot more flexibility. It has been used as an individual format, group format, and digital format. We found that, you know, be either used alone in combination with other elements always work well when compared with no treatment or weightless, but the findings have been mixed, you know, when we uh, compare it with an active group. Um, anxiety and activation and other mechanisms have been really me measured in any of these studies. What young people qualitative study shows, you know, B actually aligns a lot with how the national group, most of young people said, you know, behavioral coping is what they usually prefer to use when they are uh, experiencing depression and anxiety. When they participate in these interventions, they like having support from therapists and homework. Uh, some additional strategies, you know, how B can be improved is like, you know, in addition to behavior, it is important to understand social factors because it influences what activities one can do and how what support one can assess, how most target sessions and, you know, simplified material for young people to use. We presented these findings to our young people, our young advisor group, and, you know, they also agreed with most of the finding. They liked BA because it was action-oriented and not just talking. They also felt, you know, social factors are important and just not focus on individual responsibility. And they said, you know, we should be cautious that BA should not be perceived as a quick go, do something and be get better. Rather, it should be uh, viewed as a systematic effort. They help us identify three priorities which they felt from a young person perspective are important which is like, does BA work with all sort of anxiety, depression problem, auto-specific one? What is the impact of social cultural factors and how they influence what activities one engages with? And should we look at you know, scaling up BA-like program in school settings uh, because their behavioral focus, low resource, and can serve as an early intervention for many young people struggling with mental health issues. So overall, we found a very limited evidence, although we thought you know, BA will be an exciting intervention for young people. Uh, we found very limited evidence for us as standalone intervention. It always has been used in multiple other components, uh, but it does sound promising and more research is needing, particularly more research is needing to understand whether B as a competent works or it needs to always be clubbed with other components. Can there be group interventions which are more scalable and digital interventions as more scalable as compared to face-to-face -face and individual intervention? What are the mechanism, how it can be assessed? There were barely any research, you know, talked about 
assessment of activation. So can we use other than tools, some ideographic measurements, uh, you know, ecological momentary assessments, which are now gaining more prominence using simple questions, daily assessments, technological tools, and how overall young people feel about using something like this and sustaining their effect in their daily life. On the screen, you can also see some of the implications for practice and stakeholder involvement, which you know we could draw from our research. And that's where I um, you know, end my review. So I try to <laughs> present everything in five minutes. I'm not sure how good job I did, but it would be good to hear uh, if there are any questions. That's an excellent job, Kanika. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, really interesting presentation. Uh, and it does really reminds me, I suppose, of, of lots of other mental health interventions that maybe aren't quite as sexy and um, exciting, um, but are effective. Um, you know, the work that Dave Eakers and colleagues have done on the COBRA trial, for example, in adults with depression has shown that behavioral activation is as effective as CBT. But my hunch is that, you know, we don't have as much evidence for behavioral activation as we do for CBT. But it, as you say, is a very promising intervention. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see what questions people have got for you. Um, and uh, yes, please do stick those in the Q&A and we'll come to those in a second. Thank you, Kanika, for your talk. And next up is Faith, uh, Faith Orchard, who is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Sussex. Um, she's primarily interested in understanding the development of mental health problems in young people, particularly adolescents with depression, and um, with the purpose of improving prevention and early intervention approaches. And Faith is presenting her project for Welcome on self-evaluation. So over to you, Faith. Great. Thanks so much, Andre. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Faith Thorchard. I'm going to be talking about our self-evaluation project. So why did we pick this one? I mean, we were, as Andre said, my background is interested in um, adolescent depression. And, and as you might know, negative self-perceptions is one of the symptoms of depression. And actually in young people, we've done some research which suggests that it's one of the most common symptoms and that the severity of your kind of self-image is related to the severity of your depression. One of the things that we wanted to do right at the start of the project was to try and define what we mean by self-evaluation because it's perhaps a bit of a complex term and we've actually renamed it view of self for the purpose of the young people that we've been working with but i wanted just to highlight a few key points about what we mean so we're talking about the beliefs that a young person has about themselves and this can be both positive and negative but it also includes how they kind of judge the value of those characteristics and traits. So it includes a few different kind of key components, but primarily it's about this perception we hold about ourselves. So for our project, we started with our expert advisor events and we worked with researchers, clinicians and young people to find out what they think about self-evaluation in the context of adolescent depression and as the potential active ingredient. And once we'd done that, we looked at the findings from the expert advisors and then we started on our systematic literature search. So looking at what research had already been done. We found uh, 46 studies that broadly examined adolescent depression and self-evaluation. So we didn't specifically look for interventions as we weren't expecting there to be that many. And as you'll see from the slide, we actually only found 11 studies that looked at this in the context of treatment. Uh, we pulled together our findings from our expert advisors and from the literature to write our report, um, which we got feedback on from the advisors. So our findings very much are presented as a kind of a combination of what we learned from both of those two activities. So we've themed our results into three separate areas. I'm going to show you one by one. So the first one we called, what does it look like? And by this, we're talking about how does self-evaluation present in adolescent depression? Um, and the findings of this came from both the advisors and from the literature. And we learnt, as you might expect, that young people with depression view themselves more negatively and less positively when they're depressed. But they also compare themselves a lot to their peers. Um, and they describe their self-evaluation as being very complex. So it can differ day to day, hour to hour, person to person. So it's not that there's a general way that young people with depression will present in terms of how they view themselves. There was also a suggestion that it might be important for us to understand the frequency of the thoughts 
and how important those thoughts are to the young people rather than just their existence. The second finding then that we um, summarised mostly came from our expert advisors and we called this where does it come from and this really taps into kind of the development of self-evaluation and the influence of external factors and there was quite a lot of a discussion about how it can change with age um, and it might solidify perhaps as we get older but also that it can be massively influenced by our families our friends um, by things like bullying and stigma but also that it might feed back into depression so if we're thinking negatively about ourselves, that might end up in a negative cycle, which is perpetuating the problem. The final topic area then, which is really kind of key for the idea of the active ingredients was whether or not we can improve self-evaluation given how important it is. And most of the findings for this topic also came from our expert advisors, although there was that, that small handful of treatment studies. And it looks like it, we can improve it with our standard treatments for depression, but there doesn't seem to necessarily be any particular treatments that are good for it or you know techniques that particularly work well at the moment we don't really know enough but what was highlighted by the advisors in particular was that there's quite a few barriers and facilitators that we really need to be aware of so if, for example young people felt that this is something we don't want to target too early on in therapy and we need time and a key part of that is developing a really good stable relationship with the therapist so our key take home messages, I think, are that our advisors generally agree with us that this was quite an important part of depression, but that it's complex and each person will differ um, and they need to be treated on that individual basis. Um, it does look like we can improve self-valuation, but we need more work with the input of our, of our advisors. And in particular, I think young people really felt like they wanted more direct targeting of self-valuation rather than the assumption that it would just get better. Um, alongside the standard treatments that exist. Thanks, Andre. Wonderful. Thank you, Faith. That's a wonderful presentation. Really interesting area of work again. I'm going to move on because we're a little bit pushed for time now. So let's have our final speaker and then we can open it up for discussion. But just a reminder, if you've got any questions for Faith on that talk, then do pop them in the Q&A. Our final speaker is Victoria Pyle from King's College London. Uh, she's a NIHR fellow and clinical psychologist um, and her work focuses on developing effective and accessible interventions for young people with depression uh, and this talk she's going to give today as you can see is on emotional mental imagery so over to you Victoria. Thank you. Hi, so harnessing emotional mental imagery could improve psychological interventions for young people with anxiety and depression. Here we conducted a systematic review as well as interviewing young people with lived experience and experts in the field. Today, I'll cover our suggested definition for emotional mental imagery, in what ways it has been harnessed in interventions, and when and why it might work. So what is it? So we suggest it's the ability to simulate and manipulate multi-sensory experiences within the mind's eye by using your own internal representations. So this might be memories of events, or images of the future. Young people identify negative images. So for example, I have images of when I was bullied at school. This makes me feel useless and hopeless, as well as the lack of positive imagery. So because I feel trapped, these positive images don't really exist. Even if I think about them, they don't do anything for me. They don't make me feel more or bring happiness inside. Young people and experts spoke about imagery being a powerful part of our mental landscape that significantly influences behaviour. So given its ability to depict, process and generate emotional experiences, mental imagery could play an important role in therapy. So how has it been harnessed? We identified 86 papers with an increase in interest over the last 15 years. Interventions ranged from those targeting negative imagery, so such as imaginal exposure and imagery scripting, those targeting positive imagery and those targeting both, which we've called imagery enhanced protocols. So today I'll just highlight three of these, which we think are particularly interesting for future directions. So studies on imagery scripting mostly looked at reducing the impact of aversive memories and anxiety. So for example, aiming to change the power and meaning of an image of bullying. Imagery rescripting had by far the most consistent evidence with three randomised controls trials doing large within and between group effects in reducing social anxiety. 
One study also included cognitive restructuring and found similar reductions of both groups. Experimental studies also suggest that compared to something like exposure, imagery scripting may enable enhanced emotional processing without overwhelming the young person. Studies aiming to increase positive imagery appear promising using brief interventions. But these studies are mostly in unselected populations and focus on mood. So more research is needed. An example is to use imagery of your best possible self to improve mood. And then finally, um, the studies we categorise as imagery enhanced protocols use different approaches, but all produce really promising effects. And one example of this is our school based intervention, which we've called Imagine, which combines imagery with scripting with techniques to enhance positive imagery. So Imagine shows potential to reduce depression and anxiety in young people. Importantly, for scalability, imagery interventions tend to be brief and are likely to be transportable, as they are often protocol driven. So now to think about the factors that might influence the effectiveness of imagery. And I've just picked out a few examples from our report. So a few studies demonstrating the order of, ordering of components is important. They suggest that imagery might facilitate the effectiveness of cognitive approaches, but not vice versa. There were two studies that looked um, at self-generated content and tailoring and suggest that this could be important. But this was also something that was consistently highlighted by our experts. So, for example, someone planting an image in your head is not the same as having that thought yourself. It is not just that the image is there, it is also how it got there, which is important. There's also good evidence that imagery perspective impacts on emotional intensity. So for negative images, having an observer perspective, so looking at yourself, might be helpful to allow processing. Whilst having a field perspective, so looking through your own eyes, could be more helpful to ensure positive affect for positive imagery. So why does emotional mental imagery work? And here's three suggestions from our report. So firstly, our experts highlighted that simply becoming aware of the impact the mental imagery has on our mood and behavior is an important first step. Secondly, imagery techniques may reduce the impact and intrusive nature of negative images by reducing avoidance, enabling an emotional processing and updating their meaning. And then finally, it might be that techniques to enhance our ability to generate motivating positive images may protect against low mood and increase engagement in life. So just to leave you with two final thoughts. First, what if by not addressing imagery, so by delivering therapy only in words, we're leaving much of a young person's experience of anxiety and depression untouched and not maximizing the potential of our psychological interventions? And then secondly, what if by harnessing the power of emotional mental imagery, we could enable young people to move forward from negative experiences and switch on a positive future? Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Victoria. That's great. Really interesting work. Um, and nice to have some discussion points highlighted at the end. Um, so it's time for us to open up the discussion. And I'm going to introduce you, first of all, to a couple of people who um, are on our panel. Um, first of all, um, our expert speaker, Grace Guterra from Rwanda. Uh, do feel free, Grace, to turn on your camera and microphone now. Um, Grace is a lived experience, independent expert advisor, uh, working with the Wellcome Trust in this mental health priority area. Uh, and she also advocates from experience for affordable, accessible mental health care for all, particularly for people who come from underrepresented minorities in low and middle income countries. Thanks very much, Grace, for joining us for the webinar today. Really nice to have you here. Um, I wanted to start by asking you just generally what your views are on this Active Ingredients Commission um, and yeah, what, what your role has been in supporting it so far. Tell us a bit about it. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's such an honor to be here and also to take part in this uh, pod, um, uh, webinar. Um, I have been, I started working with the Wellcome Trust, I think the first thing I did with them was to work with the core components, which was the previous name for the active ingredients. And uh, a colleague and I, uh, Josiah, were among the people who were selected to support, uh, you know, 
cutting down the active ingredients to the final 26. And we also helped to uh, support the, you know, the writing of the RFP. We supported the, we were part of the review panel for uh, some of the uh, issues that, or some of the ones that were, you know, discovered. And then we helped to uh, speak to the funded teams uh, and personally on my own, uh, uh, you know, in my on my own uh, perspective, I was part of the of one session, so I've been very involved in this, and I think I think it's a very novel way of looking at you know supporting mental health. Uh, to me, when I first said about it, I, I couldn't even believe it, because uh, for many countries, including some LMICs, they they're not they're not very interested in you know. Or oh, maybe they are interested, but there's no funding of uh, specializing mental health care for young people. So this was a very welcome, but very surprising uh, way of looking at things. And I was super excited to be part of it. Sorry, I went on for long. My brain is not on because I'm, I have a cold. Continue. <laughs> That's fine, Grace. Thank you. That's really nice introduction. Um, and nice to have your perspective on the conversation here. I think a lot of the projects have really involved young people. Um, all of them have involved young people in some way, but a lot of them involved them in a really interesting um, way, co-producing the research, um, mm -hmm. getting views, you know, all the way through the review process. And obviously that's not the norm um, in research, um, but it very much should be, of course. Um, I'm gonna quickly turn to Niall now, um, who's our final expert speaker, Niall Boyce. Uh, welcome, Niall. Hello. Many of you know, um, Niall, he's the editor in chief of the Lancet Psychiatry, um, and very much interested in mental health research that that makes a practical difference to people's lives. Um, following on Niall from what Grace has said there, what what's your kind of overall view of this active ingredients work, this program of work from Welcome? Do you think it's it's very different? What do you think is novel about it? Are you excited by it? Well, I think it's a it's a great thing that an organisation such as Welcome, with the resource and the influence that it has, is is betting this big on mental health. I think that's got to be a good thing. Um, in terms of the approach, I like the idea of, um, of of being purely interested in results, because one of the uh, less pleasant aspects of mental health. Um, uh, albeit one of the very interesting ones is uh, the extent to which ideology uh, is, is a component. And very often, uh, I think that what I see is that people begin from a particular ideological position, say, uh, you yeah, know, medication's bad, talk is good, or talk is bad and medication is good, and decide what works on the basis of their ideology rather than the evidence. And so I think anything which um, is sort of genuinely open-minded and uh, genuinely multidisciplinary and diverse and consultative that has this practical uh, focus is 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 a you know something that's to be applauded i um my one question the one thing i'd like to push cat a bit on is this issue of of active ingredients which cat said were factors or components that are really making the difference so what i'd wonder is what is the value add of this project compared to what we'd like anyway, which is things that work, which is mechanisms that we can target. What exactly is the value add of, of welcome here? So that's the one thing. And the other thing which I'd like to push on a bit is that I think multidisciplinarity is really important in mental health. I think that there are you know, historical perspectives and cultural perspectives without which mental health uh, research Will, uh, will not be as, uh, as effective as it might be, with which we won't identify treatments which people uh, need and want and find acceptable. We want multi multidisciplinarity isn't a focus on, you know, what works. Doesn't that, that risk restricting things a bit, uh, risk a, a rather narrower perspective? So those are my two, two questions really for Kat and, and for the other panelists. Do you want to come in on that, Kat? I mean, I guess initially this question about what, the, what active ingredients are you know, um, how broad is this? Is this a really revolutionary approach or is it a different, slightly different angle on the same old problem that we've got? Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for those 
questions, Niall, and that's something that we think about a lot. So, you know, what exactly is an active ingredient? Does it add anything? I think I would say that our main aim is to kind of show that it's important to focus on the treatment and the prevention, the intervention side of things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have really good, careful mechanism-based science. But instead of asking, what are the mechanisms underpinning the symptoms of anxiety and depression? In the first place, we're asking what works and what are the mechanisms by which it is effective? Um, and can we then use that information to help improve the interventions that are available? Or can we look at the context in which they're successful and um, therefore tailor interventions more successfully to certain individuals than others? Um, so I think it's just slightly changing the focus more to the outcomes and the interventions rather than the causal mechanisms, while not wishing to denigrate any of that excellent research that has gone before, and indeed borrowing a lot of that excellent research and, and the methods um, involved. As for interdisciplinarity, I think, uh, I think maybe if we just said, right, everybody go and research your active ingredient, don't talk to each other, and um, make the case for your active ingredient as the one which is going to make the most difference, um, winner take all model, um, then that would have been a worry. Um, but I think we've taken quite a different approach and by bringing people together across disciplines, um, they've been able to see that actually we need a lot of these active ingredients interacting. We need a lot of interdisciplinary approaches even when studying a single active ingredient to understand how it works right from the um, practical level right back to the underlying mechanisms. Um, so I think there's really a lot of scope for collaboration and interdisciplinarity within the active ingredients model. I wanted to sorry. ask a follow-up question, Kat. Oh, sorry, Niall, do you want to come in? No, I was going to say, Kat, this, this reminds me actually of something that Vikram Patel said many years ago in, in the context of global mental health, which is, you know, what is the bed net of global mental health. And by that, he was using the analogy with malaria, where you know, the big intervention for malaria is the bed net. And once you've got that, you can sort of refine it. And you can say, what size bed net do we want? Do we want insecticides or not? Um, but, but once you've got that, that's a, a, a straightforward intervention, which we know works and which we can then, you know, refine on that basis. And at the time, I think the, the thinking was the MH gap guide of WHO was going to be a sort of bed net. Now, whether or not that, that's the case is maybe for others to decide, but it strikes me that maybe what you're doing is sort of reinventing um, that idea of, uh, of the bed net. You're looking for bed nets as it were. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting analogy. Um, I don't know whether there is a bed net or whether it's one of those things where we've got to acknowledge that it's hugely complex. Um, and you know, one of the things that we think about often is a lot of the research is done in high income countries and you know, the evidence that we have shows that such and such is effective in you know, high income countries. Do we know that that applies in the same way to low and middle income countries? Um, I think that's a really interesting analogy. I'm not sure if there is going to be a bed net for mental health or whether we need to think of it more in terms of this store cupboard idea and that people will have to um, decide on local solutions. Lots of kids don't even have a bed or a bed night kiss or a you know story or I suppose it, as you say it's massively complicated isn't it in mental health um, but yeah that is an interesting uh, analogy. I wanted to ask a follow-on question that was submitted by one of our participants just before the webinar Barry Gibbing was asking again this is a broad question for you Kat around the welcome work he's asking um, about the various routes that Welcome might adopt to help young people with mental health problems and how those approaches could overlap potentially. And he's asking whether you would fund overlapping areas of research and engagement activities that can take what the research is learning and use it to stimulate conversations within communities. It strikes me that that's what we're doing at the moment, <laughs> but are there, are there plans for other examples like that? Yes, I think that's a really important part of our work to change the conversation and the way that research is done. And I think um, a huge, we definitely want to incorporate, for example, um, a funding stream for youth-led research um, and citizen science and providing the um, 
infrastructure and training to facilitate that. Um, and yeah, we're definitely interested in kind of meta research. So research that could help us to answer the question of why is mental health so fragmented? As you, as Niall mentioned, um, it's quite contentious in many ways. Um, so I think, yes, we're interested in research itself, but also in kind of wider meta research questions regarding mental health and how to involve young people in that as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're going to come back to the broader questions about active ingredients towards the end, but I want to spend a few minutes answering some of the more specific questions that have been posed for people. Um, so Faith, if you want to turn on your camera and microphone again, um, you've got the most questions. I don't know what that's a reflection of. Maybe your talk was really unclear or maybe it was really brilliant and people are very engaged by it. Who knows? <laughs> um, but, um, so oh, where do I start? Um, were there any mediating factors that you found in your work um, on self-evaluation? So people think about sport or social media or other mediators. Yeah, well, so the, the literature that we looked at, um, unfortunately, there was very little research that had done this. I think there might have been one study that had looked at the effect of ethnicity and there wasn't that many ethnicities in there anyway. Um, and that was the only study that had done it in a kind of an experimental way of, you know, testing that out. Um, but it very much came through from the um, the advisors that there are lots of things influencing this relationship. And I suppose I tapped into a few of them in my talk around things like um, stigma within the family, um, you know, to parents saying, oh, you know, don't hang out with so and so because they've got you know problems. Um, lots of stuff about peer influence and, and good and bad that, you know, friends are there to support you, but also that, you know, you're judging yourself compared to others. We didn't have anything about um, social media or sport explicitly. Um, but there definitely was a lot about interaction and the role of interaction. But yeah, all these things very much just came up in discussion rather than it being that it had been, you know, directly tested out in research studies. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question that's come through from Hayden Kelleher about the techniques that can be used with young people when they get stuck in a rut of anxiety and depression. I think maybe this is a question, Faith, that you can answer, but possibly also Kanika and other speakers. What would you recommend? So this, this is generally about if we're experiencing anxiety and depression techniques that we can be trying out. Oh, it's, a, it's a broad, big question. Yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, I suppose drawing from my particular project, just to give this as a, as a concrete example, I think one of the things that came out that was really nice from our discussions was that young people wanted a bit more kind of honesty and direct discussion with their therapists about, um, you know, about how they view themselves. They wanted people to be a bit more open about it rather than hiding away and shying away from that. And I, I think that taps into the wider issue about us being open and having discussions about what we're thinking and what we're feeling. But actually, the other thing that came up that I thought was quite nice in terms of, you know, these specific techniques is young people themselves talked about wanting creative techniques to help them. Um, so thinking more about things like creative writing, creative drawing, and that those sorts of ways of examining how you feel about yourself might be kind of less influenced by the challenges we have around what language we use and that actually we can explore quite a lot of things through, you know, drawing and being a bit more creative. So I thought that was really nice. But obviously, broadly about being in a rut, there's so many techniques that we can draw on um, from lots of different treatment designs. And I'm sure others could could contribute to that as well. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. That seems to echo your work, Kanika, with your young people. Um, lots of creativity going on there as well. Yeah, so I think what we found, we found around 34 studies where young people have talked about what they naturally used to cope. And on top of their list was either behavioral strategies or a lot of social coping, you know, just finding someone who has gone through similar experience, talking to them, or just having someone who say, you know, it's, it's okay, you know, it's something you will pass. And then doing a lot of behavioral activities just, you know, break the uh, entire cycle. Um, surprisingly, cognitive emerge, you know, last of those strategies, which a young person wanted to engage, you know, when they are experiencing intense anxiety and depression. So, and, you know, even when we talk to young people, it made so natural sense with them, you know, that it's easy to do something more tangible rather than trying to reflect back and think, you know, what's going on in my brain, should I put that in auto? So my, you know, what I've learned from project and from workshop, I think, you know, those strategies, something tangible, concrete, especially with adolescents who really struggle a lot with 
making sense of uh, something abstract like cognition, these strategies may be very helpful. Great, thank you. Okay, let's move on to Josephine. That was a really interesting question from Helen Dodd. Hi, Helen, thanks for, for joining us. Um, about play, children's play, and she's asking whether that was mentioned in the review that you did, Josephine, on social cohesion. Hi. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I've been seeming to having some technical issues. That's okay, no worries. Um, sorry, yeah, I got the question. Um, so what we did really in the review was um, we looked at kind of first theoretically, so play increases social interactions and uh, it can reduce social conflict through kind of repeated interactions and the enforcing kind of, of social norms. So we first focused a little bit on that in the review. Um, and in terms of the evidence, what we really found was we found evidence for that in young, younger populations, but not the 14 to 24 year old, um, uh, 14 to 26 year old population that we were looking at uh, for this review. So there is, however, a re review that we did find that looked at um, more the general population, including younger population that found that play in outdoor spaces and engaging with natural kind of and adding natural elements in outdoor spaces did really affect, um, positively affect mental health. The other thing was from the workshops that we did was um, young people said that they really wanted to just have a voice in what kind of activities were being uh, uh, organized, but also what kind of neighborhood regeneration programs were being done. And those should include a play element is what they said. So there should be some element of just somewhere to hang out. Uh, we were th they were thinking of uh, skate parks, uh, other kind of places where, uh, where there would be a lot of kind of opportunity to interact with, young, with, with other young people as well. So that's roughly what we found. And I'm happy to share some more of the references to that as well in terms of the young people, the kind of younger population literature that we found. So involving young people in designing and building playgrounds and youth centers Make means yeah. that they get used more by young people. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, absolutely, and that's exactly what uh, what they said. It's just involvement, and they and and what we really what was quite surprising is that there was not that they didn't say that they felt really involved in any kind of neighborhood regeneration activity or uh, looking at redesigning a play program, uh, things like that. So there's really that kind of communication gap perhaps uh, in terms of that young people are interested in it but they just don't really feel like they're getting involved as much as maybe they they can okay thank you so i guess i'd like to draw it to a to a close now with a question that i'm going to ask all of the panelists um i mean it strikes me that this approach that welcome have taken with this this big pot of money that they're funding research over a number of years is quite different and it's kind of framing the questions and the way that we work together and mental health science more broadly in a different way to what we're used to. I wonder where you think this leaves us in terms of the future of mental health science. Um, Grace, would you like to kick us off with your thoughts on where you think mental health science should be going now? And really brief, you know, feel free to just say two or three words if you wish. Thank you. Uh, I think that in light of what we've seen here, I think that the, it can only be the future of mental, I don't know what the future of mental health uh, care is going to look like, but I really want it to be uh, like this. I want it to be multidisciplinary. I want it to consider out of the box thinking, and I want it to be reflective of what people with lived experience want, as opposed to what you know, mental science or researchers or you know, psychiatrists have said works. Um, yeah, that's that's what I really want it to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's clear. Noel, how about you? What do you think mental health science? What's the future? Well, I, I'd agree with Grace. I think the first thing is that there has to be the recognition that uh, mental health science is profoundly inextricably entwined with culture and without cultural understanding, uh, I, I don't think that there can really be significant advances. Um, and as a corollary to this, I think that mental health science has to question some of its most 
basic and fundamental assumptions, uh, some of which are you know, surprisingly under-examined, such as uh, we heard with, with Victoria's work on visualization. Why has that not been a bigger part uh, of clinical psychology for, for decades? And, and you know, when you start asking these very simple, basic questions, questioning these basic assumptions, that's very often where you begin to get significant advances. Thank you. Faith, how about you? Where do you think the future lies? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> there we are. Um, I think we need better collaboration and networking. So drawing on all the people that have been mentioned already, the lived experience representatives, as well as using interdisciplinary working, but we have to work better together. Great, thank you. Kanika, what would you like to add? Where do you think the future lies? Uh, I think we need to move beyond the domain of specialists, a lot of uh, non-specialists and from specialized settings to, you know, community settings to where they are seeing, you know, there's a maximum need and maximum scope. Thank you. Josephine? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, incre increasing interdisciplinarity. I also think we should maybe be ambitious and put some kind of point on the horizon that we all want to work together towards. So some type of key point that that's what the whole community is going to work towards uh, in the next five to 10 years, which we're doing as part of welcome as, of, as well, of course, but something that kind of brings the whole field together that gives us a purpose and uh, a joint mission. Thank you. Great idea. How about you, Victoria? It's hard after so many people speaking. Have you got anything to add in terms of the future of science in mental health? Yeah, I guess, yeah. So just to agree that kind of co-development is so important, but I also wonder whether what we're really aiming for is sort of a, a menu of um, options for young people. And then finally, I guess, I think what's really important is getting in early. So getting in kind of as soon as those um, symptoms are starting to really increase to offer uh, different interventions. Wonderful. Thank you. Kat? Last word to you, what would you like to say now? Well, I agree with everything that's been already said. I suppose I would also add to that, um, that research needs to be robust. Um, so more open, more replicable, uh, well-funded and well-powered studies. Um, and of course, everything that I've already said about interdisciplinarity and lived experience and a global focus. Wonderful, thank you. I guess I would add just the fact that we need to get it into practice. You know, it's all well and good having all this amazing science. I would say that, wouldn't I? Because that's what I do. But I think it's really important that we can also um, actually get it to the people who need it at the front line. So um, yeah, this has been a really interesting session for me. Thanks everyone who's joined. Um, I want to say a few quick thank yous to our amazing panelists. Um, I won't go through all name by name, but you know who you are. You've done a great job. Of sharing and making it a really interesting session. Um, thanks very much to the team at Welcome particularly for sharing this work um, and especially to Kat for giving us a really clear picture about what active ingredients are. Um, thanks a lot if you've taken time to join the webinar. We've had lots of people online and most of you have stuck around so that's really interesting. Thanks very much. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this during your lunch hour or whatever time zone it's been in for you. Um, and thanks for people who followed on YouTube and Twitter who've watched along. Uh, on the active ingredients MH hashtag. If you want more active ingredients stuff, then there's lots of it. I can highly recommend taking a look at the mental health blogs that we've written um, by uh, welcome funded researchers have written these. We've published two so far, one by Imogen Bell and one by Jennifer Lau, and we're gonna be publishing more blogs over the next couple of months. There's also audio interviews and videos and all kinds of other content. If you go onto social media and search for the hashtag, you will find it. Um, so yes, thanks very much everyone for joining us. And uh, that's it for now, so goodbye.